Awareness of the need for real change in the money system is growing. But what direction to take? What exactly is the problem? And how can it be solved? The safest and only real choice, many people argue, is to return to gold or a gold standard because this worked for millennia in the past. But gold itself is impractical for transactions in the modern world. It was impractical centuries ago, which is why the promise to pay gold system developed. And so it is certain that, in practice, transactions would be conducted in promises to pay gold, not gold itself. Thus, the promises to pay gold money will only be as reliable as the promises. So in reality, it isn't the gold that makes the system work, it's the reliability of promises. Would they be reliable promises? Maybe. But what we would be using as money would be like the old goldsmith's promises, made in the knowledge that only rarely does anyone ever ask for real gold. This was the problem with the goldsmith situation. The real gold was seldom claimed, allowing fraudulent promises of gold to be made and used as money. Why would history not repeat itself if all the same elements remained in place? Another thing, what most people say they like about the gold system is that promise of gold money is a promise of a specific amount of real value. Now this is an odd idea, given that the vast majority of us have no use for gold, so how much real value can it have for us? Wouldn't a promise redeemable in food, clothing, or shelter be much more real? People also like the idea that gold is just gold, doesn't need a government to create it. However, it does need miners. In a gold money system, Mining discoveries, jewelry making, industrial use, hoarding, and counterfeit bars of gold-plated tungsten would all influence the money stock. What on earth does any of that have to do with the need for money for trade? Lastly, gold as money is a single uniform commodity, manifesting all the inherent mathematical defects of lending demonstrated in part one of this movie. Being a coin with intrinsic value doesn't make any difference. A lot of gold and silver's appeal comes from a belief in an oversimplified version of history. People assume that coins were invented to standardize the inherent value of the metal they contain. This is true but right from the beginning, some of the earliest coins were created based on a diametrically opposed idea. This was done because the rulers at that time foresaw the inevitable negative consequences of using limited supplies of precious metals as money. Therefore, they chose to avoid that route. Instead of precious metals, these rulers struck coins of iron or copper and define their value by decree. What's more, these coins by decree were heated and dipped in vinegar, so the metal they contained would have no intrinsic value. These coins were in fact the original and true fiat money. They were merely tokens of value, money created by law and enforced by the ruler's authority. Pure fiat money is the other main idea favored by money reformers. They would restore fiat money to its true status as a national government monopoly on money creation. This current of money reform, in stark contrast to the gold advocates, insists that true money is fiat money by authority of the state. This money is to be simply spent into existence is a promise by the state to accept the same money back in payment of taxes. The taxes are compulsory, and the state also promises to enforce the acceptance of this money in court. 
These are very reliable promises and can result in very reliable money, if not abused. The problem these fiat money reformers have with the current system is that government has given away this power to private bankers and is now borrowing at interest money it could create itself with a few keystrokes just like the banks do. This results in a massive unpayable national debt on which interest will forever be paid. This ever-growing national debt expands the money supply when new money is created by the central bank to buy more government debt. And the interest burden, passed on through taxes, adds to the cost of almost everything we buy one way or another. In contrast to money being created as national debt, fiat money simply spent into existence would save the taxpayers immense sums of interest. It would free future generations from impossible debt and it would forestall the tendency to inflation because the money supply would not grow forever with the national debt as there would be no national debt. In the fiat money system, taking fiat money out of circulation by means of taxes preserves or restores the value of the remaining money in circulation. Not taxing it back sufficiently would devalue it. Understanding the proper use of government fiat money is a revelation. If you can charge prices or taxes for something in the future, you can issue that much new money now because it is your valuable services to others and the reliability of your promises that create the real value of any money. The government can honor its promises to accept its money back in taxes and it will make your debtors pay you in government fiat money if you take them to court. These are good reasons why government issued money works now and why it would work if governments just self-issued this credit instead of borrowing it from banks. But in this pure fiat money system, the money supply must still be determined by central authority. Therefore, the money supply is still limited, monopolistic, and managed from above. They have the power to create money and you have to get the money from them. They also have the power to create way too much money and spend it on wars and other unproductive activities without the approval of those whose productivity gives that money its value. In the current system, these inflationary debts are now beyond absurd, threatening to crash the entire system and drag the whole world into chaos. To save themselves, Governments are now laying impossible claims upon the productivity of generations yet unborn, a truly hopeless cause given the overall world situation. Witnessing government performance to date, many people believe that returning the full power to create money to corrupt incompetent politicians would not only fail to solve our problems, it would be the height of insanity. It would really all depend on the quality of the people in government. Fiat money reformers believe there would have to be a substantial revolution in government to wrest this power back from the banks. Therefore, they believe it would be reasonable to expect that honest and competent people with a sincere concern for the public good would be in charge. But good guys or bad, we would still be dependent on some distant someone else to maintain the value of our money. And they would have a thousand pressures and temptations to enrich themselves by not doing so. And like gold as money, government fiat money is a single uniform commodity manifesting all the inherent mathematical defects of lending at interest and twice lent money. Once the government creates the fiat money and it goes into the banking system to be lent at interest, the problems created in the current system will continue as before. So this pure fiat money idea 
might be very useful in rescuing governments from their own hopeless financial positions. And it is a limited example of the self-issued credit principle being advocated here. But pure fiat money would not address the root problems inherent in the math of lending unless the principle were expanded beyond government. Advocates of pure fiat money like to claim it is money created by law as if it were independent of economics. But if new fiat money were just spent into existence year after year without being removed from circulation as taxes, it would become worthless. What these fiat reformers tend to ignore when quoting history is that in ancient money created by law systems, the prices of critical commodities were also dictated by law. In fact, the value of money was defined by the ruler as so much of a certain commodity. Charge more or less for the designated commodities and it could be off with your head. Today, price controls like this could only be achieved in a self-isolated and totally bureaucratically controlled economy like Soviet communism. In a free market global economy, money created by law is bound by the same laws of supply and demand as any other single uniform commodity money. In other words, pure fiat money in a free market is an illusion. There's no such thing. In the third stream of money reform are the various types of so-called alternative currencies, all of them based on some concept of money being created as self-issued credit. Many examples of such systems exist today all over the world. Some are very successful business-to-business -business barter networks in which businesses create product credit money to use among themselves, independent of banks and government, and usually interest-free. Such systems are tolerated, and in Switzerland the existence of the Weir system is generally credited with stabilizing the banking system by expanding when the conventional system contracts and vice versa. But in the past, when they became too successful, alternative currencies were usually suppressed by the banking system or even outlawed by government. So, active suppression is the most significant external problem. The most common inherent problems with these systems are their limited scope and acceptance their operating costs, and the unreliability of member credit. What the conventional banking system provides, worldwide reach, affordability, credit checks, and debt enforcement, are the necessary services that are usually inadequate or prohibitively expensive in the alternative systems. Once the small group of idealistic and honest originators are joined by members exhibiting the full range of human behavior, alternative systems discover they must deal with cheaters. Some are deliberate cheaters, others just not too conscientious about their debts. And at the opposite end of the spectrum are the hyper-conscientious people who won't issue credit because they are afraid they won't be able to fulfill it. A self-issued credit system cannot work if the members are afraid of issuing credit. And that is why it makes far more sense that government and essential industries like farming, forestry, mining, manufacturing and construction should be the main and widely accepted sources of self-issued credit, not vulnerable individuals trading haircuts for pottery. However, we are talking about creating a truly liberated system of exchange. Therefore, in this proposed new system, anyone would have the freedom to issue credit, because only voluntary acceptance would determine the circulation of it. 
The cost of accounting in self-issued credit systems could be overcome entirely by emerging technologies, allowing the creation of a digital coin. Digital coins could be passed from one owner to another, peer to peer, so that no bookkeeping and no third-party involvement, like banks or PayPal, is required. This leaves only the problem of achieving global spread. Thanks to technology again, this could now be achieved at little cost and at the same rate and with the same ease that the existing social networks like Facebook and Twitter have spread. So there is a positive answer to all the questions we have posed in this movie. And there is a solution that has the potential to unite the three seemingly conflicting schools of money reform into one cohesive movement for fundamental monetary change. Because, when examined closely, be it gold, tax receipts, or someone's goods and services, all three schools of money reform are really calling for the same thing. Money that is redeemable for something specific from someone specific. Once one comes to that realization, it becomes obvious that self-issued credit for the full range of goods and services in demand would necessarily include gold, silver, and government tax receipts, as these are also things in demand. We just need to look beyond obsolete beliefs to see the heart of the situation. The all-inclusive self-issued credit system, the basis for almost all so-called alternative currencies, could contain within it both the precious metal and the payable for tax models of money without any contradiction. Money has both religious and social histories that are fascinating and go well beyond just the need for trade. But for our practical purposes in this presentation, money is the invention that overcame the limitations of direct barter. Money is, therefore, a technology, a way to solve a problem. Most of us would agree that we have a problem with our money system. This is no surprise once we realize the current system was designed by bankers in their own interest and governments wanting to pump out artificial money to wage war and pay for it with the hidden form of taxation called inflation. It was not a well thought out project of mathematicians and engineers seeking to create a money system for the general benefit of humankind. There are now many people, including mathematicians, engineers, and even cartoonists, trying to rethink money as the need to do so becomes obvious. In this presentation, we've proposed that we return as close to direct barter as we can, because doing so would anchor the money system directly to the real-world things we want to exchange. The destructive flights of fantasy money that have brought the current system to its breaking point would not be possible. Self-issued credit is not a new idea. It is, in fact, an idea as old as numbers and written record keeping. That is very old. However, only with our new technologies can it finally achieve its full potential as an international medium of exchange. And this transformation is already underway. Extensive electronic barter networks, some with their own currencies, exist among businesses right now. These could grow into a new global money system. In Canada, Canadian tire money has been a self-issued credit for goods currency for decades. This money is redeemable for merchandise at Canadian tire stores only but is widely exchanged as payment by third parties because almost everyone eventually buys something at Canadian Tire. Like Air Miles and other bonus point systems, it is only a customer reward program at present. But anything that can serve the purpose of money can be money. Private enterprise self-issued credit money already exists in several forms all over the world 
and more private enterprises are going in this direction. Money becomes money by acceptance. So one could say, the path to freedom lies before us if we can only accept new and broader ideas of what money is. Looked at logically, why wouldn't a legally binding contract for delivery of specific goods and services from a specific supplier be much more acceptable as a medium of trade than the much abused government bank monopoly money we are using now? And does it not seem natural and logical that the source of money should be the same as the source of real wealth, the productive members of society? And does it not seem natural and logical that the value of anyone's credit should be determined solely by their own proven success at living within their means, no one else's? And does it not seem natural and logical that the value of what we have earned with our work and productivity should not be susceptible to being destroyed or stolen by the gambling of some very greedy people? We hope that watching the Money as Debt series has given you insights into why our money system functions the way it does. We also hope that we've demonstrated how a return to gold or a switch to any single uniform commodity as money does not solve the fundamental problems with money. Manipulation of single commodity money has milked productive people of their life energies and prosperity for millennia that this predatory wealth extraction system could soon take the form of a single global bank emerging as an unaccountable Big Brother world dictatorship should concern everyone. We hope you're encouraged to do your own thinking about money, a subject that has been ignored and misunderstood by the public for much too long, to our great disadvantage. And not to criticize without offering an alternative, we have, in this final movie of the series, offered a comprehensive and detailed picture of how a radically new economic system might work if interest-bearing product vouchers were the medium of exchange, thus eliminating money as a commodity in itself. Instead, money would be a global measurement unit like minutes, meters, and tons. The existing physical situation on this planet is not sustainable, and the number one technical obstacle to doing anything serious about it is the current growth-addicted money system, which is itself unsustainable. The crisis is upon us. If you'd rather think about solutions than despair about the problems, think about taking back our money power with self-issued credit. Join with others who realize the need for radical change and spread this knowledge and understanding as fast and as far as you can. The masses of people must take upon themselves the responsibility to wake up, realize our power, and create something better. <laughs>